I'm Edward Parnell and I'm the author of Ghostland in Search of a Haunted Country. It, it's been really nice to see how people have taken pleasure and comfort in the natural world and suddenly their eyes have been open to stuff that's around them. I mean, I would, I'm a keen bird watcher myself and have been for 30 odd years, I suppose. And that's something I talk about quite a bit in Ghostland as well, wildlife and, and birds in particular. Um, but I've also enjoyed my local wildlife and possibly seeing things that I might have previously overlooked. So going on walks just within a couple of miles of my house, I've seen, I've found herds of roe deer and various quite interesting birds that I didn't know lived that near to my house. So that's that has been one of the, the real pleasures, I suppose, of of the, of the lockdown and the virus. So Ghostland, it was always meant to be, I think, uh, an amalgam really of, of different forms. So it's, it's partly a work of cultural criticism in which I explore lots of the, the writers that I really loved as a kid and when I was a bit older. So starting off with writers like Alan Garner and Susan Cooper and John Gordon, these wonderful writers of slightly eerie children's fiction um, but then also it then moves on to looking at the the more adult writers if you like of ghost stories and and strange fiction so people like mr james algernon blackwood william hope hodgson there's lots of victorian born writers who then were mostly active in the edwardian period i really love those sort of figures so Cornwall plays quite a role in the book. It's somewhere that I first came to um, when I was a fifth former, I think, with my brother um, in an October half term. I, he was a few years older than me, so we, we came down during that holiday um, for a week's bird watching. And I was instantly struck by it. We stayed in, in Penzance and then had a few days on the Isles of Scilly. But I just loved those quite gothic, Little, village, uh, little valleys right at the end there in the in the Land's End Peninsula, and I, I, obviously I, I really like the, the bird watching and the the interesting birds that you could find there. But I also like the landscape and all of those all of those ancient standing stones that are there, places like Menantol, and, and then just the the slightly kind of eeriness. I, I think even struck me then of places like Zena, and that's so the chapter really look, is me exploring some of those those landscapes all that history i guess that's kind of pressing outwards and the folklore as well the the piskies that might be hiding kind of next to these standing stones or or the knockers in the in the old mines all of that i think it's fantastic i am the spirit of dark and lonely water ready to trap the unwary the show off the fool and this is the kind of place you'd expect to find me. I was born in 1973, so grew up. I have memories of the of the strangeness of the 70s and the and the 80s, where there was lots of really odd things on television, on children's television particularly. It was quite dark, so I talk a lot about all of that sort of haunted generation stuff as well. This branch is weak, rotten. It'll never take his way. Fear and paranoia were staples of growing up during the late 1970s and early 1980s. Made in 1973, the year I was born, Lonely Water is a public information film I vividly remember seeing at the cinema as a boy before whatever main feature I've been brought to see. In recent years, it has acquired a deserved cult reputation for its dark, warning content. Watching it now, you'd think there was little danger that any child who saw lonely water would set foot on a riverbank or the shoreline of a reservoir ever again. Yet I did still go fishing with only a friend for company and we often did end up messing about near the water, which makes me wonder whether the film's message was lost on their target audience. Perhaps the known risk added an illicit thrill we found impossible to resist. Watching lonely water again, the grisly relish Donald Pleasance's spirit takes in his description of these lurking dangers is one of the most unnerving elements about it. This brief voiceover role might well be the most frightening of his long career. The lad, fortuitously, is rescued from the water by two sensible passing children who chide him in thick Cockney accents 
Oi, mate, that's a stupid place to swim. And the spirit is exercised, leaving just a discarded robe on the muddy ground that's thrown into the water by his rescuers. But Pleasance is determined to have the last word, the spirit's voice reverberating as the camera lingers on the cape that is by now sinking beneath the brown waves. I'll be back. I'll see you at North Cornwall Book Festival. <laughs> <laughs>